So chapter four, motion in two and three dimensions. The thing to remember about this chapter is that 2D motion and 3D motion are really just doing two or three one-dimensional motion problems. We already have these four equations of constant acceleration motion that we use for 1D motion. We just need to apply them twice to get 2D. Now your book, I think, gets, gets a little more confusing than it needs to uh, when it starts discussing these two points. So we have a coordinate system, we have an x-axis, and we have a y-axis, and it discusses two points, a point P1 and a point P2. And to get to these, uh, between these two points, you have to change your... Uh, position, so you do a displacement, a displacement dx, and you do a displacement, displacement dy. And your book goes into lots of details to get to, get to a very simple result that the velocity in the x direction is going to be equal to the change in the x direction, dx, divided by the change in time. We already know this. We know the definition of velocity. It turns out the velocity in the y direction is going to be very similar, except it's the change in position in the y direction, dy, divided by the change in time. And we can get our final uh, velocity vector, v, is equal to square root of vx squared plus vy squared. And we can do a similar process. Uh, your book goes into more detail than it needs to about how to find the acceleration. Acceleration in the x direction is equal to the change in velocity in just the x direction divided by the change in time. And the, change, the acceleration in the y direction is equal to the change in velocity in the y direction divided by the change in time with the final acceleration vector equal to the square root of ax squared plus ay squared. And the thing to note here is we're separating out directions we have things happening in the x direction and things happening in the y direction. And it turns out a very useful property of, of motion in two and three dimensions is that we can separate these. We can always separate the x from the y. The x direction is separate from the y direction. Now before we get too involved into separating out this x and y motion, we have a subtle little aside to make regarding the acceleration and its definition as being equal to the change in velocity over the change in time. Let's say we have something going at a constant speed. That means that the velocity magnitude isn't changing. But if it's changing direction, then that means we have an acceleration. This is described in example one, where we have a car, I believe. We have a car, and it's on a road, and it's taking a turn. Here's my road, here's my car, and I'm driving along at a constant velocity. But there's something important that's happening here that has to do with this little arrow. I am changing my direction the whole way that I'm keeping my constant speed around this curve. Since my direction is changing, my velocity is changing, and I have an acceleration. This will become important later on in the chapter. Uh, to review this and make sure you understand it, look at example one and try check up number 4.1, numbers one through three. Okay, getting back to uh, the key points of, these, of this chapter, separating motion into x and y or potentially z direction if we have a three-dimensional case. We can generalize all of our vectors that we know about. We can generalize position vector. Here I'm going to describe it as an r. is going to be equal to something happening, some magnitude in the x direction times i hat plus some magnitude in the y direction, so that's going to be j hat, plus some magnitude in the z direction, that's going to be called k hat. We can do this with velocity. We can generalize our velocity vector to uh, work in three dimensions. We have some vx in the i-hat direction plus some vy in the j-hat direction plus some vz in the k-hat direction. And finally, we can do this with acceleration. Acceleration is going to be equal to acceleration in the x-direction 
the i hat plus acceleration y and the j hat plus acceleration z in the k hat. And we have general vectors for all possible dimensions. And the really nice thing that we're going to be able to do, we're going to be able to separate these vectors and only operate on things that happen in each direction. So i direction is going to be separate from the j direction is going to be separate from the k direction. It means we might have to do multiple steps to a problem, but the approach is going to be exactly the same as we've done in the previous chapters. So what we're going to do a lot of in this chapter is solving projectile motion. This is the prototypical example of motion in two dimensions. What we have with projectiles is I have maybe a ball and I throw it in the air. And it's going to move in an arc-like path, reach the top of its path, and then come falling back down in this uh, specific shape. This shape is called a parabola. This type of motion is happening in two dimensions. If I draw my coordinate system, I can see that I have some motion in the x direction and I have some motion up in the y direction. To solve this problem seems like it would be very difficult, but we can actually solve it all with 1D motion, 1D equations. All I have to do is separate out what's going on in the x direction and what is going on in the y direction. And I do that with the kinematic equations. So I will write down in the x direction, what is my change in position? My change in position, change in x, I can solve with an equation equal to 1 half v initial in the x direction plus v final in the x direction times delta t. I have another different equation I can use to find the change in position in the x direction. It's going to be equal to the initial velocity in the x direction times delta t plus 1 half times ax, the acceleration in the x direction, times delta t squared. So what you'll notice is I'm just writing down the kinematic equations that we already know, that we've already been tested on. Vx, the final velocity in the x direction, is the initial velocity in the x direction, plus the acceleration in the x direction times delta t. And finally, I can do the acceleration in the x direction times the change in x is equal to 1 half times the final velocity in the x direction squared minus the initial velocity in the x direction squared. And I can repeat these equations, same exact equations, for the y direction. Except instead of delta x, I'll just plug in a delta y. is equal to 1 half the initial velocity in the y direction plus the final velocity in the y direction times delta t and so on and so forth. So your book likes to present uh, projectile motion and give you a lot of equations to memorize. I'm going to use a slightly different approach. Uh, I'm going to use what I call the two-column approach to doing projectile motion equations. You don't really have to memorize uh, anything new. It's all based on equations we already know. And to show you this approach, I'm going to go with an example that your book lists, example number 7, which is on page number 109. Page 109. And in this example, we have this guy standing here. He's an Olympic discus thrower, and he's going to take his discus, and he's going to throw it up into the air, and he's going to throw it at an angle. He throws it at an angle given in the problem of 45 degrees, and we know that this is going to follow a path. If we've done our reading, we know that this path is something called a parabola. This is the path that a projectile follows. Uh, it's kind of an arc. So our projectile is going to go up and reach some top point, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to label that top point. Label the top. and then our projectile comes back down and lands. Something to note is this kind of projectile is actually symmetric. The path up is going to be uh, very similar, almost exactly the same as the path down. So the time that it takes to go up to the top is equal to the time that it takes for the uh, projectile to, to land back on the ground. We need to pick a coordinate system, so we're going to draw on our coordinate system here. 
my x and my y axis, my i hat, and I'm going to say that to the right is positive, and I'm going to say for my j hat direction that anything up is positive. The final piece of information that we're given in this problem is that this initial velocity, the velocity that I throw the discus with, is equal to 26 meters per second. And we are asked to find a few things. We are asked to find the maximum height. I need to find the height. We are asked to find the range. So we're asked to find how far the projectile goes. And we're asked to find what is the time of the flight. So how long is the projectile in the air? So if I want to write out what these things are, I want to get a clearer picture of what's going on in this problem. I have, here's my ground. I'm asked to find the height. The height is how high up this thing goes. I have a height. So that's the change in position in the y direction, really. That's how high it goes. So I'm going to call that change in y. I'm asked to find the range, how far in the x direction this goes. So I'm going to draw in my range. And that is going to be delta x. We have a nice big picture on slide number five, and we'll repeat this picture right here uh, just in a smaller form so that we can refer back to it occasionally. guy standing here throws his discus and it has an arc like that and we know that this angle that it arcs with is 45 degrees and we know this velocity that it leaves with is 26 meters per second and we know we reach a top of our path It travels some range delta x and some height delta y. And the key to solving these kinds of projectile problems is to recognize that the x and y are separate. x and y are separate. All the motion in the x direction depends only on what's happening in the x direction and all the motion in the y direction depends only on the y direction. So I like to do a two column approach where I separate things out into x direction and the y direction. And I just write down all the variables that I might possibly be interested in. So in the x direction I have delta x. And I don't know what that is. And I have a delta y. It's going to be the height. I don't know what that is. I have v initial, some initial velocity, only in the x direction. And I can solve for that if I look at what I have. I know that the velocity is 26 meters per second at an angle of 45. I can label my vx. So let me put a little vx in here. Just the x piece of this initial velocity. I'm going to call that vx. It is the adjacent side to my angle. So I know that my vx is going to be v initial times the cosine of my angle. And then my v initial in the y direction, I can draw that in. v initial in the y direction, coming up here. And I'm on the opposite side of this triangle that I can draw with my initial velocity. And I find that v0y is v0 v0 times sine of theta. You can plug in your numbers and you can find V0x is going to be equal to our initial 26 meters per second times cosine of 45 is equal to 18.4 meters per second. 
And you can plug in your numbers for the y direction as well in the same way, and you will find the y direction is also 18.4 meters per second for an initial velocity. For the final velocity in the x direction is equal to what? Something that always confused me when I was a student was the final velocity is when I hit the ground right here. So that should, in my mind, be zero. But in physics problems, what we're talking about is not the velocity after you stopped. It's the velocity right before you hit the ground. So I'm still traveling at some velocity. And in this case, I don't know what the final velocity in the x direction is. Let's, let's fix that. final velocity in the x direction, and I don't know what that is. Final velocity in the y direction, this is one of the subtle things that the book tries to tell you to memorize. And it gives you very specific situations where you can do it. I prefer to do things this way, where the, where the final velocity at the top of my path. So right here, at the very, very top, I reach some maximum height, and I kind of stop moving in the y direction. I'm still moving horizontally, but my y direction motion stops right at the top of my path. So that means that the v final in the y direction for the top of my path is going to be equal to zero. And then I have another v final y, the v final that I get right at the end of of when I right before I hit the ground and that's going to be equal to something we don't know yet acceleration in the x direction now most problems will ignore air resistance and there's nothing really pulling on this than this projectile in the x direction to make it accelerate so the acceleration in general in the x direction for projectiles is going to be zero another useful thing to know and the acceleration in the y direction is going to be equal to a negative 9.8 meters per second squared because gravity is acting on this guy pulling it down. And the final point to make is the time. What is the change in time? I don't know what the change in time is, but I do know that the change in time for the x direction is the same as the change in time for the y direction. So I think of the time as kind of being the linking factor between the x and y directions. It's the only thing that's the same between both directions. And now I've written down everything I could possibly want to know, everything that I possibly do know. So one of the things we're asked to find is this change in y, this height. It's very convenient because I know a lot of information for the y direction. I'm looking for delta y. I don't know what that is. The initial in the y direction, I know what that is. That's 18.4 meters per second. I solved for that already. And that's in my little two columns. My final velocity in the y direction, I don't know what it is when I hit the ground, but I do know what it is at the top. And the top is where I reach my maximum height. I know at my maximum height, my velocity in the y direction is 0 meters per second. I know my acceleration is equal to negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Gravity is acting on this, pulling it down. Acceleration in the y direction is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And I still don't know what the time is. Change in time equals something. If I look at all these things I know, I can use one of the kinematic equations. I can use A times change in Y is equal to 1 half times V final Y squared minus V initial Y squared. I solve this for change in y, so I divide both sides by a, and I get my equation, change in y, the height that I'm looking for is equal to 1 half times the final velocity in the y direction squared minus the initial velocity in the y direction squared 
all divided by the acceleration. And now I can just plug and chug all my numbers. Change in y equals 1 half. The final velocity in the y direction squared is 0 minus the initial velocity, 18.4 meters per second. And I square that. And then divide everything through by negative 9.8 meters per second squared. My negative up top will cancel with my negative down bottom, and I get delta y, when I plug this into a calculator, is equal to 17.3 meters. So that is the maximum height that I can reach. And I've finished one third of the problem. If we go back to the problem, what else do we need to find? We need to find the range of this projectile, and we need to find the total time it's in the air. So what should we look at first? Let's look at what we know. In the x direction, I don't know delta x, I don't know v final in the x direction, and I don't know change of time. In the y direction, the only thing I really don't know is the change in time. So I'm going to say let's concentrate on the delta y direction where I know a bunch of stuff, a bunch of information, and see what I can find. I can probably find a delta t. So let me find a delta t using my kinematic equations. So what kinematic equation do I want to use? I can use vf in the y direction is equal to v0 in the y direction plus a in the y direction times change in t. And I'm going to shuffle this around, do some algebra, and solve for delta t. So I subtract v0y from both sides, minus v0y on both sides, and I get v final y minus v initial y is equal to ay times delta t. I can divide both sides by ay. My ay is going to cancel on the right side divide by ay on the left, and I get my equation for delta t is equal to vf minus v0y, all divided by a in the y direction. I can plug in all of the numbers that I have, and I find delta t is equal to v final was 0, minus v initial is 18.4 meters per second, all divided by negative 9.8 meters per second squared, and I find a delta t that's going to be equal to 1.88 seconds. And what we need to do, we need to think about what this delta t actually is. I'm using the final velocity for the top. So this is finding the amount of time it takes my projectile to go up to the very top of its path. It's not accounting for the time that it takes for it to fall back down. But, as I mentioned earlier, this is a symmetric problem. The left side of the path is the exact same as the right side of the path. So the total time that this projectile is in the air, total time... is equal to 2 times the time to go up. It takes 1.8 seconds to get up to the top, and then another 1.88 seconds to fall back down. So the total time that I'm interested in here, the real delta t I want to use, is going to be 3.76, which is 2 times 1.88. So I just found my change in time another quantity that I'm asked to find. And I can plug this in in my x direction. So now I know in the x direction my change in t is equal to 3.76 seconds. So let's take stock of what we know and what we need to know. In the x direction I'm looking for the range. I'm looking for delta x. I know v0x is 18.4 meters per second, just st taking stock again of what I know. And I've known this from the very beginning. v final in the x direction, I don't know what that is. a is equal to 0, but I now know delta t is equal to 3.76 seconds. I used the y direction, which I knew a lot more about, to figure out what this change in time was. In general, the change in time is going to be the link between the x and y direction. 
link between x and y. So I can look at my kinematic equations now and I can find one that will let me solve for what I'm looking for. I have delta x mm, equals v0 x delta t plus one half times a delta t squared. And now I can just plug and chug in all my numbers. Delta x equals 18.4 meters per second times, change in time is 3.76 seconds plus one half times the acceleration which is zero times 3.76 seconds that's going to be squared. The zero cancels everything out and I find my delta x is 18.4 times 3.76 which gives me 69.2 meters. The only suggestion I can make regarding finding the right equation to use is to look at what you know and find an equation that evolves what you know. Uh, the best practice to get good at this is to literally just practice. Solve your homework problems and you'll be able to eventually pick out that this is the correct equation to use. Practice will make perfect. So we've got a little bit of a random inclusion here in the chapter, something called uniform circular motion. And in uniform circular motion we have an object moving in a circle. So I can pick the velocity out at this point on the circle, and the velocity is, is tangent to the circle at that point, so my velocity is going up. Maybe call that v3. I can pick another point over here, my velocity. It can be the same exact magnitude velocity, but it's going off at kind of this angle. Call that v2. I can have a velocity, I can have a velocity up here. Along the circle, I draw a tangent to that circle. Maybe my velocity is going going in that direction, v1. Now the magnitudes of all these velocities, v1, is equal to the magnitude of v2. My speed, the magnitude of the velocity, is not changing as I'm going around in this circle. Magnitudes are all equal. But I can very clearly see the direction is changing. V3 is going up. V2 is going uh, off at an angle. V1 is going kind of down and at an angle. So the directions are changing. And if direction changes, that means the velocity is technically changing. And if the velocity changes, then we have an acceleration. And for uniform circular motion, this acceleration is called A, and I'm going to label it with a little C, which is going to stand for centripetal. Centripetal. And that's going to be equal to velocity squared divided by R. So that's how I find the magnitude of my centripetal acceleration. If I'm moving in a circle, it's the velocity squared divided by r, where r is going to be the radius, which is one half of the diameter of a circle. Now since it's an acceleration, acceleration has magnitude and direction, so again, this is how I find the magnitude, how do I find the direction? I can use the right hand rule, I can use various other uh, techniques, but they all result in the same thing. I draw my circle, I can attach my velocities. My velocities all go tangent to my circle. So here's my v3 again. Here's my v2 again. And each one of these velocities, since it's changing direction, has some kind of acceleration associated with it. And those accelerations all point in the same direction. Acceleration for centripetal acceleration for uniform circular motion always points towards the center of your circle. 
AC centripetal acceleration points towards the center of your circle. The final part of chapter 4 discusses how motion is all relative, and it does this by talking about reference frames. So we have th two different reference frames. We have one reference frame that's at rest, and we have a second reference frame that's moving. In your book, the example is the reference frame at rest is the shore, the reference frame that's moving is a ship. And then we also have another third object. We have this boat that's moving relative to our moving reference frame which is also moving relative to our rest reference frame. So we have multiple different things moving, and they're all moving relative to each other. The book uses this to derive the concept of Galilean velocity addition. It's a specific way to add velocities. And it works when you have multiple different reference frames that are moving with respect to each other. And they present this equation, V is equal to V prime plus a capital V zero. And your book does a pretty good job describing this equation and deriving it for you. What it doesn't do such a good job of is defining what all these variables are. So this first velocity is the velocity of your object relative to your rest frame. So it's the object in the rest frame. Object in the rest frame. Our v prime is the velocity of the object relative to our second frame of reference in the moving frame. And finally we have this big V. This big V is the velocity of the moving frame. So again, remember big V is the actual frame, V prime is the object relative to the moving frame, and V is the object relative to the rest frame. So let's try to understand relative motion and how it actually is useful with an example. Let's say I'm in a boat. I have a boat on one side of the shore and I want to make it across to the other. Now I take my boat and I start sailing across in the I'm going to call it east. We can also think of it as the i-hat direction. So I shoot my boat directly across this stream. My goal is to land exactly across from where I started. And I have some initial velocity, some initial velocity of my object with respect to the water, and that's going to be 18 kilometers per hour in entirely the i-hat direction. Now this water has some flow. It's, it's a moving reference frame. It has some speed associated with it. So when I send my boat across, it's subjected to this current. This current is going to make my boat change directions. I think we can all see that the boat isn't going to go directly across. It's going to end up moving slightly at a slanted path. This current is going to drag my boat up, and I'm going to land way up here far away from where I intended to. Because of this stream of water, this current, let's call it the Gulf Stream, and we'll say the current is about 4.8 kilometers per hour in the J-hat direction. So let's trace out what my resultant velocity actually ends up being. I end up with this velocity vector. This velocity vector is going to be a combination of my boat velocity mixed in 
with my current velocity, which drags me up. And I can write out a vector that represents this velocity, this v, is going to be equal to the speed of my boat across the water, 18 kilometers per hour, and that's going to be in the i-hat direction, plus the speed that the current exerts on my boat, 4.8 kilometers per hour, and that's going to be in the j-hat direction. So now I have my final vector. This is the resultant velocity that I have, and I can see that it looks very, very similar to an equation I already know. If I plug in that my Gulf Stream is the speed of my moving reference frame, and with our previous equation, our equation for Galilean addition, this was a big V with a little zero next to it. and for my object with respect to the water. This had a very specific label. An object with respect to the moving reference frame was V prime. And if we recall what the equation was for Galilean velocity addition, V is equal to V prime plus v0, which is the exact same equation that we just found without having to know the equation for Galilean velocity addition. We just kind of intuitively did the equation because I think this, this example makes a lot of sense. We can tell that the boat tries to sail directly across, but the current drags it upstream, and it ends up landing higher up than it otherwise would have. So we have our Galilean velocity addition that gave us our velocity resultant vector is 18 kilometers per hour in the i-hat direction. That's the velocity of the boat. We'll label this v prime uh, plus the velocity of the current that's dragging us up and results in this landing a little bit higher, a little bit off from our goal, and we'll call that v0. Now to figure out what this resultant velocity magnitude is, I can see that I have a right triangle here. So I can take the x component squared plus the y component squared to give me the square of my velocity. So I use Pythagorean theorem to find my velocity is going to be equal to the square root of the x component squared, here is 18, plus the y component squared, here is 4.8, and I take that square root and I find my velocity is equal to 18.6 kilometers per hour. But I'm not done yet, because velocity is a vector. This is only the magnitude, so I need to find what the direction of this is. I can do that by labeling my angle. Here's my angle. I can see that I want to use the tangent of this angle is going to be the opposite side, v0, over the adjacent side, v prime. I can plug in my numbers and find theta is equal to the arc tangent, or the inverse tangent, of v0, which is 4.8, divided by v prime, which is 18 and I find a theta equal to 15 degrees. So think about this problem, think about this relative motion example, and consider the following challenge question. Where do I aim the boat if I want to end up directly across from where I started? Think about that, use the book, see if you can figure out the answer, and we'll discuss this in class.